Hey everyone, hope you're having a great day. We're gonna get started here in section 11.4 for contemporary math. And we're starting with a couple of typos. I've messed up the title on your notes, I apologize. Please change it to the fundamentals of probability. Now at this point in chapter 11, we've been studying counting principles. We've looked at the fundamental counting principle, permutations, and combinations. Now, remember, all three of those techniques are used to count the number of outcomes in either a series of decisions or a particular situation. Now that we know how to count outcomes, we can begin to measure the likelihood of one of those outcomes occurring. And this is the study of probability. There are two types of probability. There is theoretical probability and empirical probability, and they're both very useful. And we will begin in 11.4.1 with theoretical probability. Definition, the probability of an event is a measure of how likely it is that the event will occur. Probabilities can be quoted as percentages, 0 to 100 percent, fractions 0 to 1, or decimal 0 to 1. Now, you hear about probabilities all the time. For example, when you woke up this morning, you may have checked the weather, and you saw that there was a probability of how likely it would be that it would rain, or maybe what's the probability that we're going to have a particular storm move into our system. So probabilities are a measure of likelihood. Before we talk about how we measure that, we're going to talk about the scale for probability. Probabilities can range from 0% down to 100%. So a percentage is one way of measuring a probability. We can also do this with fractions or decimals. So 0% would correspond to 0 for the fraction. 100% would correspond to 1. Now, right there in the middle, we have a 50% probability. And as a fraction, that would be 1 half. As a decimal, it would be 0 0.5. So that's the scale that we use to measure probability. Now, we associate this with particular words related to those specific points on this scale. If something has a probability of 0%, we say that it is an impossible event. If something has a probability of 100%, then it is a certain event. And the events that fall right there on the middle of the scale, we call those 50-50. It could go either way in that case. Now, we can talk about the regions between those high points, such as between something being impossible up to 50 50 percent we call that an unlikely event and we've already associated that word with the probability of winning the lottery from our study of combinations if something has a probability of greater than 50 percent we say that it is likely so in addition to our numerical scale, we also have this qualitative scale where we describe the likelihood of an event occurring. Now, let's talk about a few more definitions. Any occurrence for which the outcome is unknown is called an experiment. So we're going to begin our probabilities with an experiment. So for example, toss a coin. That's a very basic, simple experiment roll a die, play a card game, predict the gender of a baby, predict the occurrence of a disease and offspring. So those experiments, of course, increase in complexity, and we're going to look at examples of each one of those. Now, the set of all possible outcomes for an experiment is called the sample space, and a lot of times we denote that with the letter S. Notice we're dealing with a set, so this is going to remind us of what we learned in chapter 2 with set theory. Any subset of the sample space is called an event, and we call that sometimes letter E. So you can think of the sample space like the universal set. It's our frame of reference. It's the set of all possible outcomes. Whereas an event is a subset of the sample space. If you want to imagine it with a Venn diagram, you could say the sample space as the universal set. Some subset of that sample space is called the event. 
Now, here's how we actually measure probability. How do we associate a numerical measure with something called likelihood? The probability of an event E is given by P of E. That's the probability of event E. This is equal to N of E divided by N of S. Now again, this harkens back to chapter two. Remember, this notation represents cardinal number. So we're looking at how many elements are in the set E and how many elements are in that universal set or that sample space. So the cardinal number of E is the total number of outcomes in that particular event, and the cardinal number of the sample space is the total number of possible outcomes. So the way that we measure probability or likelihood is looking at how many times or how many ways can that particular event occur relative to the total number of possible outcomes. And that measure is called probability or a measure of likelihood. So let's take this formula, cardinal number of the event divided by cardinal number of the sample space, and experiment with it under several conditions. Let's begin with dice problems. These are fundamental problems, very simple experiments that help us to understand how to calculate probability. Example one, roll a fair, balanced, six-sided die. Now remember, die is singular, dice is plural, so we're talking about just six-sided dice that you can play in um, a basic board game or something like that. So one fair, balanced, six-sided die. List all the outcomes in the sample space. So when I roll a die, the sample space is going to consist of all of the numbers that could land on the upside of the cube, right? So we could get a one, two, three, four, five, or six. So that is our universal set. That is our frame of reference. Again, we call that the sample space, the set of all possible outcomes for this simple experiment of rolling a die. Now, we're going to find the probability of several events, and we're going to determine if the event is certain, likely, 50-50, unlikely, or impossible. So the first one, what's the probability of rolling a six? Well, the way we calculate this with our probability formula, how many outcomes land on six? Well, there's just one of those in the sample space, right? So one event is a success for rolling a six, and the others um, are unsuccesses, right? Now, the size of the sample space is the total number of elements in the set. So the probability that we roll a six is one out of six. Now, we can turn that into a decimal, we can turn that into a percent, but as far as our qualitative description, because this is less than 50%, now notice, three out of six would be right there in the middle, that's the 50%. This is less than that 50-50 mark, we would say it is unlikely. Let's try the next one. What's the probability that we roll a seven? Well, no element in our sample space is a seven. So there are zero ways that a seven can occur out of six. Zero divided by six is zero. So the probability that we roll a seven is zero, which means that this is an impossible event. Our result is not part of the sample space. Let's look at another one. What's the probability that we roll an even number? Well, we're going to look at how many different ways can we roll an even, so the cardinal number of rolling an even number divided by the cardinal number of the sample space. So if we look at our sample space, we've got one, two, three numbers that are even out of a total of six numbers. So our probability as a fraction would be one half. As a percent, we could say 50%. Our qualitative description is that this is a 50-50 event. That means it is equally likely as not. And that's kind of a more scientific way of saying it. Equally, whoops, equally likely as not. And again, a concise way of expressing that is simply to call it a 50-50 event. Let's look at the probability of rolling a number less than five. Now pay attention to the wording. We're talking about strictly less than five, not equal to five. So we have one, two, three, four numbers that are strictly less than five out of a total of six numbers. 
One of the unwritten rules in math is that we always reduce a fraction or put it in simplest terms. So notice both 4 and 6 have a common factor of 2. So if I divide 4 by 2, I get 2. 6 divided by 2 is 3. So 2 thirds is our fraction probability here. Now, in case you didn't know, with your, frac with your calculator, you can reduce a fraction. So if you'll type in your fraction and type your math button, option number one, and press enter, it will reduce your fraction for you. Now, I know you can reduce that fraction, but I wanted you to know that technique on your calculator in case you get a more complicated looking fraction. Also, while we have the calculator up here, let's just observe, we can turn this fraction into a decimal. We could approximate it at 0.67. This is approximately 0.67 or 67%. So two thirds, 67%. Again, the two thirds is the fraction measurement for the probability. 67% is the percent measurement for the probability. Since that is greater than 50 cent, 50%, we say that this event is likely. So the words that we're using here, again, is a qualitative description of the result, whereas the number is an actual measurement of the likelihood. Example E, roll a number less than 3, that's strictly less than 3, not equal to 3, or greater than 5. Now, we know that and and or are very specific in what they communicate. We learned that in our logic chapter in chapter 3. So or means uh, this side could be true, or this side could be true, or they could both simultaneously be true, right? So it's not as stringent of a condition as the word and. So let's look at how many numbers are less than three. We have one and two. Those numbers are less than three. And let's look at what numbers are greater than five. Six is greater than five. So we have three total numbers that are less than three or greater than five out of six possible outcomes. When we reduce this, we end up with a probability of one half. And again, we could call that 0.5 or 50%. So this is the, again, 50-50 qualitative description. Now let's change our, our or to an and. Now remember for an and, think about logic. For an and, a conjunction statement to be true, both sides have to be true. So I'm looking for a number that is less than three and greater than five simultaneously. There is no number that is both less than three and greater than five. So we would say this is zero out of six outcomes or a probability of zero. And again, we could call that 0%. With 0%, we say this is an impossible event. So that's a very simple introduction to probability. Let's compound this experiment, make it just a little bit more difficult, but not too bad. This time we're gonna roll two ordinary six-sided dice. Suppose one is blue and the other is red. Sum the results and use the chart below to determine the sample space. So we're going to roll these two dice. Let's suppose that the one across the top is our blue die, and it can result in a one, two, three, four, five, or six. And let's suppose that the outcomes for our red die are listed here in the vertical column. Same outcomes, one, two, three, four, five, or six. Then we're going to sum the values on the results of those two dice. So let's suppose that we roll our two dice and they each turn up to be a one. We're gonna go ahead and sum those results to see what um, this different experiment will result in. So if we get a one and a one, the sum is two. If we roll a one and a two, the sum is three. Again, I'm just summing the face values here. If on column two, we roll a one and a two, we're gonna get a three, a two and a two would be four. And can you see the pattern begin to form? You can add those individually, but once you spot that pattern, you can go ahead and very easily fill out your chart. So the numbers in the boxes represent the sums of the two dice that we have rolled. So what we see right here, although it's not in roster notation, 
This is our sample space. So using this sample space, um, let's first observe that the cardinal number of the sample space, the number of outcomes in our sample space, you can think of it as 6 times 6, we've got 36 total outcomes. So find the probability then of rolling doubles. Doubles occur when both of our dice end with the same value. So for example, a 1 and a 1, 2 and a 2, 3 and a 3, so on and so forth. So we can see that those outcomes occur along this diagonal here. So we're going to count how many of those outcomes are doubles. That would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And we're going to measure it relative to the size of the sample space, which is 36. So 6 divided by, or 6 divided by 6 is 1. 36 divided by 6 is 6. So the probability of rolling doubles is 1 out of 6. Now, we could also convert that into a decimal or a percent very easily using our calculator. If we round this two decimal places, we could say 0 0.17 or 17%. So it is also classified as an unlikely event. Let's look at the probability of achieving an even sum. So we're going to go through our sample space and we're going to count all of the even sums. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So 18 out of 36 results turn out to be even. And notice that reduces to the fraction 1 half. So this is a 50-50 event. And doesn't that make sense? If we backtrack for just a minute, the probability of rolling an even number on a single die we found was 1 half. So that has to be true for both dice. So the probability of receiving an even sum is also a 50-50 event. And we could assume that the probability of resulting with an odd sum would also be 1 half or 50%. Let's finish by finding the probability that we attain a sum less than 7. That is strictly less than 7. So I can see this diagonal here where the sum is exactly 7. So I want everything except for that 7. Again, we want to be less than 7. So I'm going to count the results in that little upper triangle on our grid. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 results. So we could say 15 out of 36 times we would attain a sum less than 7. Notice we have a common factor of 3 in both the top and the bottom. So we need to reduce this fraction. 15 divided by 3 is 5. 36 divided by 3 is 12. So we can say the probability of a sum less than 7 is 5 twelfths. Now, with our calculator, once again, let me demonstrate. You can take 15 out of 36. You can reduce that by pressing your math button, choosing option number 1 fraction to get 5 twelfths. And you can also very easily convert that into a decimal with division. So approximately 0.42. 0.42 or 42 percent. And let me emphasize I am approximating, so I'll do a squiggly equals. Since this is less than 50-50, we say it is more unlikely than likely. So, so rolling a die, rolling two dice, that's an example of a very simple experiment. This is called theoretical probability because we can map out every single possible outcome. That's not always true in the real world with different types of experiments. But in this case, because we can map out every single outcome, we can measure the likelihood of each one of those outcomes relative to the size of the sample space. Let's look at a different experiment. Card problems. A standard deck of 52 playing cards, so no jokers, has the following properties. So if I think about a deck of playing cards, it has the composition as illustrated there in the diagram. There are 52 total cards. 
there are four suits, clubs, spades, hearts, and diamonds. So if I look across the rows, the shape is called the suit, clubs, hearts, spades, and diamonds. There are 13 cards per suit, so I've got 13 cards in each row. Clubs and spades are black cards, hearts and diamonds are red cards. The jack, queen, king, and ace, or the jack, queen, and king are face cards or picture cards. So each card belongs to a specific category. If I choose one particular card, um, it, its kind is seven, its suit is heart, and its color is red. And again, the numbers going in columns, that's called a kind. So we have suits, we have kinds, and we have colors. Now, imagining or visualizing this deck of cards, let's work some probability problems. Example three, you are dealt one card from a standard deck of 52 playing cards. So what's the sample space? Well, the sample space looks like the deck of cards. I'm just choosing one card from, or I'm being dealt one card from that stack of 52. Find the probability of being dealt a jack. So if we look at our cards, there's four different cards that are classified as jacks. So four ways we can get a jack, jack of clubs, jack of spades, jack of hearts, jack of diamonds, and we have a total of 52 possible cards. Now, the common factor between 4 and 52 is 4. 4 divided by 4 is 1. 52 divided by 4 is 13. So our probability then is 1 out of 13 as a fraction. And of course, we could convert that into a decimal if we were asked to do so. Let's look at the probability of being dealt a heart. Now, the jack, remember, was a kind. Now we're looking for a particular suit. So I want to look at all the cards that are hearts, and we know that there are 13 of those. So 13 hearts out of a total of 52 cards. We can reduce by 13. 13 divided by 13 is 1. 52 divided by 13 is 4. So the probability of being dealt a heart is 1 out of 4, or 25%. Now, let's get even more specific. What's the probability of being dealt the jack of hearts? Now I have a specific kind and a specific suit. That is only one particular card that can satisfy both of those requirements. It is a jack and it is a heart. It is the jack of hearts. So there's only one card there that satisfies that description out of a total of 52. So our probability then is one out of 52. Let's try a heart or a club. We know and and or are very important. That was true for set theory with intersections and unions. That was true for logic with conjunctions and disjunctions. And it applies here in probability as well. A heart or a club. That means the card can be a heart or a club or both. But in this case, there's not any cards that are both hearts and clubs at the same time. So let's look at how many hearts we have. We've got a total of 13 hearts, as we previously established, and we've got a total of 13 clubs. So that makes 26 cards out of 52, and that reduces to one half. So a heart or a club so if I'm dealt a card that is either a heart or a club, we say that that event has been a success, right? And we have a 50-50 probability of getting a heart or a club. Now let's change the word from, and, from or to and, which means the card has to be a heart and a club at the same time. There are no cards that are simultaneously hearts and clubs, so 0 out of 52 gives me a probability of 0. The last one, let's look at a jack or a heart. Now remember, over here in example C, we did the jack of hearts. Like That's like saying the card has to be a jack and a heart at the same time. Now we're looking at the card can be a jack, so that would work, or it can be a heart. Notice the jack of hearts belongs to both categories, um, but we want to know how many cards are either a jack or a heart 
or in the special case of this one, both. So we have 13 total hearts. We have four jacks, but we don't want to count the jack of hearts twice. So if we count those cards, we would end up with we would end up with 16 out of 52. Notice the common factor here is 4, so 16 divided by 4 is 4, 52 divided by 4 is 13. So our probability of getting a jack or a heart would be 4 out of 13. Now let's see what that is as a percentage. 4 divided by 13 gives us approximately 0.31, and I'm just rounding to two decimal places here, or 31%. So if you understand the composition of a deck of cards, especially looking at that diagram there, those are very simple and straightforward. But when we start calculating probabilities, sometimes things can get a little bit complicated. So let me give you a challenge problem. Example four, in poker, each player is dealt a five card hand. Remember back up here in this example, we were getting one card from a standard deck of 52. Now in a poker game, we're talking about being dealt a five card hand. Find the probability of being dealt four aces and the queen of hearts. So that's a pretty good hand in poker, right? So how many different five card poker hands have specifically all four aces and the queen of hearts? Well, there's only one poker hand that has that description out of all possible poker hands. Well, how many ways can we be dealt five cards from 52? Now remember, if I have the cards in my hand and I rearrange those cards, I don't get anything new. So I'm going to have to count this with a combination. We have a total of 52 cards and we're going to take them five at a time. So remember, we can very easily evaluate that with our calculator. We're going to use our math probability menu and we're going to calculate 52C5. 2,598,960. So one hand out of 2598960, one card, or, or I'm sorry, one five card poker hand out of a possibility of 2,598,960 different types of five card hands, I'm going to get four aces and the queen of hearts. You know what that means? That means that is a very unlikely hand. Okay, are you ready for a challenge? I included this one just as a challenge problem. So don't be intimidated or, or panic too much about this, but I want you to see how your counting principles will play into being able to calculate some probabilities. Let's look at the probability that our five card poker hand is composed of three of a kind and a pair. Three of a kind. Now remember, we had 13 different kinds, right? If we look at our cards up here, there's one kind, two kinds, three kinds, so on and so forth. We have 13 total different kinds. So there's 13 different kinds, and we want three of any of those kinds, okay? So to make this easy, let's just focus on one kind. So I'm going to pick a kind, okay? Let's suppose I want to figure out the total number of ways that I can get three eights. Well, there are four eights, and I want to choose them three at a time. So there are four C3 different ways that I can get three eights in my hand, okay? So that's my first kind. However, we know that there are a total of 13 different kinds, so I need to multiply that by 13 to get the total possibilities there. We looked at the eights to figure this out, but we know there's 13 other 13 ways that that can happen, okay? Now, once we have our three of a kind, the pair has to be of a different kind than the first three cards in my hand, right? So that means there's only 12 kinds left. Let's say that for my second kind, I'm going to get queens. There's four queens. We want two at a time. So we'll calculate that as 4C2. And we're going to divide the whole thing by the total number of possible five-card poker hands, 52C5. All right, so let's count our combinations. Uh, four, I'm going to calculate 4C3 to begin with. 
So 4C3 gives us 4. So we have 13 times 4 times 12. Let's calculate 4C2 next. That's going to give us 6 out of 2,598,960. Okay, so let's multiply that together. 13 times 4 times 12 times 6, and we get 3,744 out of 2,598,960 possibilities. Now we can tell this fraction needs to be reduced because both of those numbers are even. So I'm going to let my calculator do the work on that one. 3744 out of 2598960. And I'm going to turn that back into a fraction and it reduces to 6 out of 4165. Okay, so if I look at this number, that tells me the total number of possible five card poker hands that are composed of three of a kind in a pair, 3744. But as far as probability goes, I can tell this is pretty unlikely uh, because it's way less than the halfway mark. Now, obviously, the complexity of that problem really compounded with the five card hand as opposed to calculating probabilities for being dealt a single card. So you can imagine how combinations, permutations, the fundamental counting principle are very necessary in calculating those probabilities. Now let's switch the experiment from rolling dice and drawing cards to something such as genetics. Probability is often used in genetics as well. For example, sickle cell anemia occurs with two dominant genes. So we're going to use a capital S to represent uh, the gene for sickle cell anemia. An offspring receives one gene from their father and one gene from their mother. Now, a non-fatal condition occurs with a recessive gene. So capital S represents sickle cell anemia, lowercase s, that's the recessive gene. Now, if both parents carry one dominant and one recessive gene, so both parents have this for their genome, what is the probability that their offspring will have full-blown sickle cell anemia? So let's suppose these two parents know that they carry one recessive, one dominant gene for sickle cell anemia, and they want to know what's the probability that our offspring is going to have that our offspring will inherit the dominant gene from both parents and have full-blown sickle cell anemia. So a lot of times, the way we determine this is with a Punnett square, and you may have seen this in um, a biology class. So we'll put one parent here, the, they have one dominant, one recessive, and one parent here, maybe mom is over here and dad is over here. We're going to look at all the different possible ways that their genes can combine. So this is the one we want to watch out for, two dominant genes. Here, dad gives capital S, mom gives little s. Here, little s, big s. And here, little s, little s. So in this particular grid, we can see all possible outcomes. So these results comprise the sample space for this condition. And we want to know what is the probability that the offspring will have full-blown sickle cell anemia. Well, that occurs with two dominant genes. So one out of four possibilities would have full-blown sickle cell anemia. That's a 25% chance, which we measure more on the unlikely scale than the likely scale. Now, um, let's just take a little further. What's the, the probability of the non-fatal condition? S, capital S, little s. Notice there's two of those. So the non-fatal condition, two out of four, or one half, or 50%. Okay, but the question that was asked here was for this one. But you can use that Punnett square to organize your sample space and then calculate probabilities. Now, remember, probabilities are measures of likelihood they are not predictions. They, um, again, are just a way of understanding outcomes in an educated way before they occur. Let's try this one in genetics. 
A couple is planning to have three children. Find the sample space for their potential family compositions. All right, so the sample space for this couple, we'll write it in roster notation. Let's say B represents boy and G represents girl. So one possibility is that the couple has three boys in a row, right? Or maybe they have two boys and a little girl. Or they may have a boy, a girl in the middle, and a baby boy. Or possibly a boy and two little girls, right? Now, we can kind of find the inverse of all of those. They may have a girl first and boys second. They may have girl, boy, girl. They may have girl, girl, boy, and the last one, they may have three girls. Now, notice we could use the fundamental counting principle to make sure that we covered all of our bases, right? If we apply the FCP to make sure we got all elements in the sample space, think of it this way. The couple's going to have three children. For the first child, there's two possible genders. For the second child, two, and the third, two. So if we multiply those together, we get eight possible family compositions. And we came up with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it looks like we covered all our bases. We have both predicted the number of family compositions using the fundamental counting principle, and we have listed them specifically in our sample space. Now, once we have our frame of reference complete, we can answer some interesting questions. What is the probability that the couple has three boys? Well, there's one out of eight family compositions that has three boys in a row. So one out of eight, and if we want to turn that into a percent, we're just going to convert our fraction to a decimal. This is 0 0.125 or 12 and a half percent, right? What is the probability that the couple has at least one girl? Now, let's talk about what at least means. At least one girl means um, one girl, that's at least one girl, two girls, that's at least one girl, or three girls. That's still at least one girl. So we want to exclude the possibility that there are no girls, right? So if I look at each of these outcomes, those seven have at least one girl. There's only one that has zero girls. So the probability there would be seven out of eight. If we want to turn that into a percentage to help us to interpret it, this would be 0.875 or 87.5%. So they're very likely to have at least one girl in the family. What's the probability that the couple has at most one girl? So the dad says, you know what? I can't handle the drama. One girl is enough for me, right? So he says, one girl at most, that means one girl or zero girls, that's still at most one girl. So if I go back to the sample space and count all of those events, we would come up with all boys, that's at most one girl, right? One girl, girl or less. We have this possibility, this possibility, or this possibility. So it looks like four out of eight have at most one girl, which is one half. We know that's 0 0.5 or 50%. So that's in that uh, midline of the scale of 50-50 chance. So in this video, we covered theoretical probability. Remember, that is where you can list every possible outcome of the sample space. Then calculating probability is the samples, is the cardinal number of your event divided by the cardinal number of the sample space. We looked at problems involving dice, problems involving cards, and even problems involving genetics. So this is basic fundamental probability.